Now let's read and analyze Marianne Moore's poetry and Archibald MacLeish's Ars Poetica. After we analyze these poems, you can compare my diddles analysis with the one that you have worked on. When you're sure that yours is correct, go ahead and submit it. We will start by reading poetry by Marianne Moore out loud. I too dislike it. There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. Hands that can grasp, eyes that can dilate, hair that can rise if it must. These things are important not because a high-sounding interpretation can be put upon them, but because they are useful. When they become so derivative as to become unintelligible, the same thing may be said for all of us, that we do not admire what we cannot understand. The bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat, Elephants pushing, a wild horse taking a roll, a tireless wolf under a tree, the immovable critic twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea, the baseball fan, the statistician, nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. All these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction, however. When dragged into prominence by half-poets, the result is not poetry, nor till the poets among us can be literalists of the imagination, above insolence and triviality and can present for inspection imaginary gardens with real toads in them shall we have it. In the meantime, if you demand on the one hand the raw material of poetry in all of its rawness and that which is on the other hand genuine, you are interested in poetry. So now let's look at poetry by Marianne Moore and apply our DIDDLES acronym for analyzing literature to try to better understand it. And one of the techniques that I like to use when analyzing poetry is I like to look at the connotation of the words. And so connotation is uh, the way a word makes us feel when we hear it. And so words can either be positively connotated or negatively connotated. And what I like to do is look to see, does the poem have more positive words or negative words? And that's the first step at giving me a sense of what this poem might mean. So, you know, in the first four words, Marianne Moore's speaker, and that's what we refer to as the person in the poem, unless otherwise named, we just refer to that person as the speaker, not the author. So the speaker in these first four words says, I too dislike it. And this idea of disliking poetry is a pretty popular one. Um, and I hope that at the end of this unit, you won't have a dislike for it. But let's look and see, are there other negatively connotated words that are going to give us a sense that this might be a downer kind of poem? So um, she calls poetry all this fiddle, and fiddle is sort of nonsense. So that's a kind of negative word. Contempt, I don't know if you know what contempt means but it's like disdain or a very strong dislike for something. And so she's saying, when reading it, I have a dislike for it, a, a, a disdain for it, a contempt for it. So I would say that's a pretty negative word. Um, and then she says, there's the genuine, but that's a kind of positive word. In it, you discover this place for the genuine. And so right about here, I see a shift in connotation. We went from that sort of negative introduction to a little more positive approach to understanding it. And then she further goes down to say um, this kind of 
imagery and it and it's um really hardcore imagery because she tells us exactly what it is hands that can grasp we can touch that we can we can feel that eyes that can dilate we can see dilated eyes hair that can rise if it must um, we all know that like static electricity will will cause hair to stand straight up something like that we can see that image then she says these things are important not because a high sounding interpretation can be put upon them but so let's just talk about this for a minute she's talking about these things what things hands that can grasp eyes that can dilate hair that can rise those are all actually rather ordinary occurrences i think she does that on purpose because you'll remember a, a moment ago she told us she disliked poetry and that when you read it you can sort of discover this real hatred towards it <clears throat> excuse me but that there is some place for the genuine and so i think these common ideas right here I think these are the place for the genuine. She says we don't dislike it when it's real, when it's something we really understand, when it's, when it's something we can see or feel or touch. And then she goes on to say, <clears throat> it's important not because there's a high sounding interpretation, but because they are useful. And so this high sounding interpretation, that's kind of what Billy Collins was talking about in Introduction to Poetry, when he talked about kids wanting to torture a confession out of it. Um, we have this idea that to understand poetry, it, you have to be um, really educated and use very big words, and it has to be um, all sort of psychologically and intellectually deep. And Marianne Moore is saying, actually, when it's genuine, that's when poetry is useful. She goes on to say, when poems and you'll remember the they in this poem is the poem itself so we're talking about the poem as though it's it's a tangible thing um when poems become so derivative as to become unintelligible when they're so intentionally created to to be high sounding we nobody gets it they become unintelligible she says that actually can also be applied to us to people when we try to sound like we know more than we know we become unintelligible people can see right through it and it's not a genuine thing of beauty she says that we do not admire what we cannot understand <clears throat> that is a really interesting phrase that we do not admire what we cannot understand so um if we don't get it we don't like it right and that's exactly what's true of poetry but that's sort of a universal truth so if i was looking for a theme in this poem i would say that's like all over it we don't admire what we don't understand when poetry is difficult to understand we don't like it but then she tells us some tangible imagery based examples of things that we can't understand and so maybe we don't like them a bat holding on upside down or in quest of something we don't understand the bat and so they kind of scare us or elephants pushing a wild elephants pushing or a wild horse taking a roll or a tireless wolf under a tree these things all have mystery to them we don't fully get it why they do what they do how they do it. we'd like to study it but we often don't admire something that we don't understand then she gets a little um, less concrete in her image the immovable critic and then this image you can see twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea and you'll notice the enjambment here that caused me to keep reading a horse that feels a flea and so here she the speaker invokes this idea of people who read the poem to criticize it to say whether it's good poetry or not and um she in, interjects that person into her poem and makes a comparison to a horse that's skin is twitching because there's a flea on it um so the critic that kind of gets that twitch um uh, maybe because they can't get it they can't reach it and then she continues with that kind of concrete tangible imagery the baseball fan the statistician um 
she's saying that both of these things are things we don't understand. We often don't understand the baseball fan. Um, people sometimes, I love baseball, but people sometimes say baseball is a slower sport to watch. And so that brings a little mystery into what kind of person enjoys this um, sport. But if you know baseball intimately, then you know that it's one of the most complex and interesting sports and that there's uh, thought and knowledge and information behind every play that a player makes goes on to say the statistician, that's the person who's keeping track of all that interesting stuff. But when we don't understand it, we just say, eh, that's boring. She goes on to say, nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. And so now she's saying that poetry um, is not a whole lot different than business documents and school books. All these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction, however, when dragged into prominence, Prominence is a pretty high sounding word. It means importance um, by half poets. And she's saying the problem is we get drawn into poetry by people who aren't really poets. And when that happens, the result is not poetry. And then she says, nor till the poets among us can be literalists of the imagination. She's calling on the poets here saying, you've got to make your imagination real for us above insolence and triviality can present for inspection. So until a poet among us can present to us, and then this is the example she gives, and it's just beautiful, and it's in quotes. So my guess is it's actually an allusion to something. You should look that up. Um, not, and what, what are we gonna inspect? Imaginary gardens with real toads in them. And not until we can do that, she says, shall we have poetry. And then another shift in the meantime. So between disliking it and waiting for someone to do it well, she says, if you demand on the one hand the raw material of poetry in all its rawness and that which is on the other hand genuine, you're interested in poetry. So I think what she's saying here is good poetry is real and raw and genuine and people get it when it is that.